This slide series is done in memory of Dr. Edward Ross Ritvo, who passed away in June of 2020 at the age of 90 years. A pioneer in autism research, he led the field in establishing that autism was neurobiologically based. A graduate of Harvard and a U.S. Army veteran, he spent his entire academic professional career at UCLA. His work included studies of diagnosis and classification, genetics and epidemiology, as well as neurobiology and psychopharmacology. He trained generations of leaders in the field and is survived by family members and many, many students. It's an honor to dedicate this series of talks to his memory with the support of Dr. Ariella Viva Ritvo, Slifka, and the Allen B. Slifka Foundation. My name is Kristen Powers, and I am an occupational therapist who has worked with both children and adults, primarily those with an autism spectrum or other neurodevelopmental disorder for over 30 years. I am currently the rehabilitation coordinator at CCSN Behavioral Health. I also provide consultative occupational therapy services in the school setting. I will be speaking today about such services for individuals with an autism spectrum disorder or ASD in school settings. Occupational therapy or OT is a field that addresses occupational engagement and participation in particular contexts. For children within the context of a school setting, the occupations that the OT address may consider self-care skills, play, academics, social engagement, and even use of technology. In doing this, the OT will examine a variety of underlying factors that may impact participation in these occupations, including motor performance, balance, fine motor skills, visual motor performance, attention, cognition, perceptual abilities, and motor planning. The OT will also assess sensory processing abilities, a particularly important area for students with an ASD and the topic of today's presentation. There are some words that we will be talking about that are used frequently by OTs to explain different concepts in sensory processing an area that we will go into in more detail. Neurological threshold refers to the amount of sensory stimuli that is needed to generate a response. When the nervous system responds quickly to sensory stimuli, we describe that as a low neurological threshold. When the nervous system responds slowly, we describe that as a high neurological threshold. We ultimately want a balance so that a student is attentive to important details, but doesn't become overwhelmed. Self-regulation refers to the ability of managing one's own sensory need. This can allow us to manage sensory information by obtaining needed input or withdrawing from aversive or unpleasant stimuli. Hyperresponsivity refers to an overreaction to sensory information. A child who covers her ears with the sound of a vacuum may be demonstrating a hyperresponsive reaction. Hyporesponsivity refers to an underreaction to sensory information. A child who displays an extremely high pain tolerance may be demonstrating a hyporesponsive reaction. When we talk about the vestibular system, we're referring to the part of the inner ear that manages balance and spatial orientation. Proprioception is a term that refers to the sense of body position and awareness of movement. Proprioceptors are located within muscles, joints, and tendons, and are triggered by movement. The final term, interoception, refers to the perception of the internal state of the body. 
This involves such states as hunger, thirst, and fatigue. At the conclusion of this presentation, participants will be able to define sensory processing and discuss the impact of sensory processing challenges for a student with ASD. Participants will identify the differences between high and low thresholds of arousal and how this may be seen in the classroom. Finally, and most importantly, participants will be able to identify strategies that can be used with students to assist with regulation in the classroom and around the school. Sensory processing is the connection between our neurological functioning and the environment. It allows for the management of the sensory world around us. It helps us to learn appropriate responses to typical sensory experiences and allows us to maintain a regulated state throughout the day. For students with sensory processing challenges, we may observe clumsiness, poor body and space awareness, overreaction to touch, covering of the ears as if to block out sound, excessive seeking of, or withdrawal to sensory input and poor motor planning. Sensory modulation allows for ongoing adjustments to new or changing stimuli. Think of your reaction to hearing a loud, unexpected noise at 3 p.m. versus 3 a.m. Some individuals with ASD may display the same reaction at 3 p.m. that they did at 3 a.m as they have difficulty adjusting to incoming stimuli. Poor management of incoming sensory stimuli can lead to a student becoming easily overwhelmed, resulting in fluctuations in arousal. An example I often use to illustrate this is driving a car. On most days, we can drive with our kids talking in the back seat and listen to the radio while going from one place to another without paying too much attention to details. Now think about what it happens when it unexpectedly starts to sleep. We hunch over the wheel, turn off the radio, and tell everyone in the car to stop talking so that we could see where we are going. There is considerable impact of sensory processing challenges in the school setting. If sensory information isn't organized properly, it may lead to problems with everyday activities. We may see difficulty with the physical aspect of dressing due to poor body awareness and manipulation, behavioral challenges due to regulation issues, anxiety, depression, and even learning difficulties in school. Students may have a difficult time shifting attention as they over-attend to unimportant sensory cues, such as the hum of fluorescent lights in the classroom. They may display exaggerated responses to seemingly benign sensory occurrences, such as another student accidentally bumping into them. Some students may avoid situations or settings that provide unwanted sensory experiences. For example, some students avoid the cafeteria due to the combination of sights, smells, and sounds. Winnie Dunn provides an excellent framework to understand the interaction between our neurological threshold, how soon we respond to sensory stimuli, and self-regulation, our ability to manage sensory information. For students with a high neurological threshold, they may respond more slowly to stimuli, and tend to be hypo-responsive or need a lot of sen sensory stimuli for registration. These students may appear passive or lethargic and may not notice sensory cues around them. For students with a low neurological threshold, they may respond more quickly and tend to be hyper-responsive or need little sensory stimuli for registration. These students may display a fright fight or flight response to sensory experiences or even sensory defensiveness. These students may avoid sticky materials, 
playground equipment, or going into the cafeteria. Students may have an active style of self-regulation to manage their needs and seek to provide necessary sensory input. Other students may have a passive style of self-regulation and merely allow things to happen. These students may need our support to help them obtain the appropriate amount of sensory input. By understanding these unique patterns, we can then modify the environment to provide opportunities for additional sensory input or to structure the environment to reduce sensory stimuli. While we understand that students may be seeking or avoiding sensory input, it is also important to understand the different types of sensory input that may be affecting the student. In doing so, we must consider the different sensory systems, the visual system, a response to the visual environment, the auditory system, response to sounds, the tactile or touch system, the vestibular or movement system, the proprioceptive system, which incorporates body awareness and body position, oral sensory, referring to the mouth and sense of taste, and finally, the olfactory system, referring to the sense of smell. Students who are hyper-responsive or overreactive to visual input may avoid bright lights or press or rub their eyes. Finding objects in visual clutter may also be challenging. They may have a harder time in classrooms that have a lot of decorations and visual information on the walls. Students who are hypo-responsive or underreactive to visual input may seek spinning items or bright clothing. These students may be slow to respond to their visual environment and may ultimately require more time to generate a response to visual information. There are strategies that would assist a student who is hyper-responsive to visual input, and these can include providing periodic visual breaks, especially after reading or other written work. It may be helpful to reduce visual clutter and distractions on the walls and in the immediate work environment, including reducing glare. It may also be helpful to cover half of the page on worksheets to mi minimize visual input. For students who are hypo-responsive to visual input, it may be helpful to add visual interest to written materials, including highlighting important work and providing color to worksheets. These students may benefit from adding bright colors and light to the work area. Preferred items such as spinning or light up toys could be offered as reinforcers. Students who are hyper-responsive to auditory input may cover their ears with loud or unexpected noise, hum to block out noises around them, and even avoid noisy settings like the gym or cafeteria. Fire drills can be particularly challenging due to the nature of the loud noise as well as its unexpectedness. Students who are hypo-responsive may require more time to respond to auditory input, including directions, and may make loud noises for additional feedback. Some of these students bang or crash their toys and materials for the added sound. We may notice humming or singing as a way of adding sensory input. For students who are hyper-responsive to auditory input, a warning before loud or unexpected noises would be beneficial. This may be particularly helpful in a fire drill. Alternatively, headphones could be worn during the drills or in settings that are noisier. Small groups may be better tolerated for lunch. Slow, calming music playing quietly in the background or white noise may mask unexpected sounds that may be distracting or distressing to a student with auditory hypersensitivity. 
For students who are hypo-responsive to auditory input, more active settings may be beneficial. These students may prefer to play with materials that offer sounds and auditory feedback, including musical toys. It may be helpful to provide visual supports through lists, check-off sheets, or a visual schedule when providing any verbal directions. Students who are hyper-responsive to tactile input or touch may avoid sticky materials, display exaggerated responses to unexpected touch. They may avoid hygiene tasks and certain items of clothing because of the way they feel. Preschool teachers often relay that their students avoid classroom materials like glue, Play-Doh, or paints, ultimately impacting their participation in the classroom. Students who are hypo-responsive to tactile input may seek items that offer a distinct texture or surface or be slow to respond to touch. Many of these students run their hands over different materials and surfaces in the classroom when they are looking for additional input. Sometimes they fidget with classroom materials and then have a hard time paying attention to their work. For students who are hyper-responsive to tactile input, the teacher can offer task modifications to avoid touching materials that are sticky or perceived as unpleasant. For example, use of gloves during cooking activities or a paintbrush with gluing activities can help the student participate with her peers. It may also be helpful to place the student at the end of a table instead in the middle of a group of three. It is always recommended to be judicious with the use of unexpected touch, including hugs or tickles. For students who are hypo-responsive to tactile input, the teacher could provide materials that often heighten tactile interest with different textures and surfaces, including textured balls, stretch fidgets, slime, sensory bins, and finger paint. Some handheld materials could also be offered during work opportunities, circle and transitions as a focused fidget to prevent seeking of other items that may be more distracting. Students who are hyper-responsive to vestibular or movement input may show intolerance to movement and even avoid playground equipment or PE activities. The duck bus driver may even report that a student becomes car sick on the ride to school. Students who are hypo-responsive to vestibular input seek excessive movement like twirling or spinning. These students may even show poor safety awareness and judgment by taking extreme movement or climbing risks. For students who are hyper-responsive to vestibular input or movement, a referral to OT and or PT may be warranted to assess why the student is intolerant. Be respectful of a student's refusal. Never force a student to participate in a movement activity like using a swing or a slide. There are some ways that you can encourage the student to join in recess and playground activities. Asking peers to join may facilitate participation, including goal-directed activities like obstacle courses or ball games. For students who are hypo-responsive to vestibular input, consider offering guided structured opportunities for movement, such as obstacle courses, swings, and playground equipment. Goal-directed opportunities may assist the child in staying in a more regulated state. Some children may seek additional input by repetitively spinning or twirling themselves, contributing to dysregulation. Providing more purposeful movement opportunities may ultimately be more beneficial to the student. Some students may even benefit from a cushion on their chair to provide needed movement. 
Proprioception is obtained through input from our muscles and joints and helps us know how to move our body. Think of a time when you went to pick up a suitcase or box, thinking it was gonna be really heavy when your arms snapped back when it was very light. This is an example of our proprioceptors firing to let us know how to move our body and how much force to exert. Students with proprioceptive challenges may have a hard time estimating how much force or pressure to use during movement. Some students may seek additional feedback by pushing their bodies into an adult, jumping in place, or seeking squeezes or hugs. Some of these students may also display decreased stamina or sit awkwardly in their chair. For students with proprioceptive challenges, it may be helpful to offer heavy work activities or those activities that provide additional input to the joints, tendons, and muscles of the body. Activities such as jumping jacks, transporting a box of several books, and pushing and pulling activities could be considered. Carpet squares or hula hoop during circle can provide visual support for body and space awareness. The oral sensory system refers to input that is provided in or around the mouth, while the olfactory system refers to the sense of smell. Students with hyper-responsive oral sensory or olfactory systems may reject certain tastes or foods that are typically part of a child's diet. They may even avoid the cafeterias due to the smells. Students who are hypo-responsive to oral sensory or olfactory input may seek items with intense flavors or smells. Some students bite or chew on clothing or on pencils to provide themselves with additional oral input. Students who are hyper-responsive to oral sensory or olfactory input may benefit from minimizing odors such as eating lunch outside the cafeteria in an alternative setting with only a few other students. Be mindful of your own perfumes and fragrances as potential distractors to your students. Pairing a new food with a preferred one may assist with expanding a narrow repertoire by slowly desensitizing the child to the taste. For students with a hypo-responsive oral sensory or olfactory system, offering foods and materials with heightened fragrances and spices may add needed input. The OT or speech therapist can offer suggestions for oral motor tools and foods that can provide additional oral sensory input, including chewy foods, gum, or whistles. Students may demonstrate sensory processing challenges in one or a combination of the aforementioned sensory systems that affect their participation within the academic setting. Interoception, or the sense of the internal state of the body, is another factor that should be considered. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, needing to use the bathroom, and emotional state are other factors that can impact sensory regulation. By identifying the implicated sensory systems, we can then match the appropriate sensory input to the student according to their unique sensory profile. An important consideration of providing sensory input is when to offer the activities. It is always recommended to be proactive and offer sensory activities that can be easily embedded throughout the course of the day. Taking a walk, delivering a message to the office, completing a short obstacle course, and handheld fidgets, like stress balls, are all easily accessible activities and items that can be used before a challenging lesson, prior to a transition, or as a reinforcer for work completed. 
I would be cautious against using the activities and items in the middle of a behavioral escalation as they can be inadvertently reinforcing negative or undesirable behavior. The student could be escaping from a task demand and providing a fun sensory activity could reinforce the escape behavior. Using activities that match the sensory profile of the student will make these activities or items more rewarding. For example, for a student that seeks deep pressure, Play-Doh, use of a trampoline, or hand squeezes, all would provide guided deep pressure input that the student is looking for. For a student who does not like touch or materials that are sticky, some of these activities might actually be aversive. Once we know the sensory system and have determined if the child is seeking additional input or trying to limit sensory input, we are able to determine potential strategies. Let's see how this may look for a student at school. A kindergartner may display an exaggerated response to other children bumping into her. She may have a low threshold and ultimately be described as hyper-responsive or overreactive to touch. This child may even actively avoid situations where unexpected touch may occur. The teacher may see this in the classroom when the child wants to always be last in line so that no one bumps into her unexpectedly. Additionally, the student may not want to use glue or other sticky materials. For students who are hypersensitive, guided and gradual exposure or desensitization may help increase tolerance. For example, the teacher might ask the child to touch finger paint with the tip of one finger and wait five seconds before washing her hands. The next time the student is asked to finger paint, the teacher may ask the student to touch the finger paint with the tip of two fingers and wait 10 seconds before washing her hands. We may also want to consider modifying the environment to limit unexpected touch. The teacher could place carpet squares on the floor during circle or have the student sit at the end of the table instead of in the middle. The teacher might offer the use of gloves or a paintbrush for gluing activities. Another common observation that is seen in school is the child who is actively jumping and running around the classroom. This child may be seeking additional movement input as well as proprioceptive input by the jumping. This student may be hypo-responsive or slow to respond or underreactive to this type of input. Providing opportunities for guided, goal-directed input may be beneficial to the student. For example, offering a child a set of four short motor steps to complete upon arrival at school and prior to periods of sustained listening may help the child attain needed movement opportunities without becoming dysregulated. Today, we address the impact of sensory challenges for students with ASD within the academic setting. The school-based occupational therapist is an excellent resource in helping determine the sensory profile for these students. Understanding the implicated sensory system and whether the student is seeking additional input or trying to minimize sensory stimuli will allow us to modify the student's immediate environment and offer opportunities that match their sensory needs. Thank you so much for attending today's presentation. The next slide contains recommendations for further reading, followed by the references for this presentation.